Kia ora koutou, greetings, good evening. My name is Dean Knight and I'm one of the associate direct, uh, directors of the New Zealand Centre for Public Law and it's really wonderful to see so many folk uh, with us tonight celebrating as part of our landmark series the 40th anniversary of the passing of the Treaty of Waitangi Act 1975 and the birth of the Waitangi Tribunal. Now to commemorate this anniversary we have with us today one of I think the the legal figures who has featured heavily uh, in the life and business of the tribunal, Justice Joseph Williams, and it's probably an understatement to say that he's featured uh, heavily because we'll hear more of that to tonight. And it's through his eyes um, and his observations that will reflect on the role, the work and the life of the tribunal. <coughs> Our guest tonight, and I think as he prefers it, Judge Joe, or perhaps how he gets called more oftenly, um, studied and taught at this very law school and continues to be a very good friend of the faculty and it's always a pleasure to have him back in these, in these halls. As a litigator, he crafted a practice centering on treaty claims and Māori legal issues. Uh, when he started, I think that was a bit of a, somewhat of an innovation amongst the large private law firms. Uh, and then followed appointment as Chief Judge of the Māori Land Court and as a member of the Waitangi Tribunal, initially as Deputy Chair and from 2004 the Chairperson of that, that Tribunal. Uh, Justice Williams continues um, his distinguished uh, judicial career today, uh, serving as a Judge of the High Court. And tonight he is joined in conversation uh, by Radio New Zealand's uh, Catherine Ryan, um, who we're delighted to have uh, as a guest of ours tonight also. And she will help curate uh, the discussion and reflections on 40 years of the Waitangi Tribunal. The first bit of housekeeping I have, though, do you mind just checking that your cell phones are off or on, onto silent so that the conversation can continue smoothly? And with that, can you please welcome me, uh, join with me in welcoming our two guests tonight. And I pass over to you, Catherine. Na mihi din, tēnā koe, e nā rau rangatira mā, tēnā koutou katoa, e te kai whakawājo, tēnā koe, nā mihi mahana. Good evening, everyone, and a special greeting to you, Judge Joe. How's my volume? Can we hear? Okay. Thank you very much. Well, 40 years of the Waitangi Tribunal, 40 years since the passing of the Act, 30 of them you've been involved with very directly, uh, less directly, uh, but we're going to talk more about how you see things from your perspective as a High Court judge now. But 30 years ago when you were first directly involved perhaps in cases, can you tell us, Judge Joe, where the tribunal was at in its history and its development? So I first uh, got involved in the Waitangi Tribunal's jurisdiction during the Te Reo Māori claim, which was for the most part being heard here at Waifetu Marae in Lower Hutt. And I was a junior lecturer in law at this faculty um, and gave uh, a brief submission to the tribunal that then was made up of um, Chief Judge then Eddie Jury, now Sir Eddie Jury, uh, Sir Graham Latimer and Paul Tem. Um, so that was a time of transition. Uh, for the 10 years between 75 and 85, the tribunal had no retrospective jurisdiction. It was um, focused only on current and future breaches of the treaty. It was an answer to the, um, the call of not one more acre by the great Māori Land March of 1975. It took it about 10 years to decide that it would open what was feared in 1975 as the Pandora's box of New Zealand's historical claims. But during the Te Reo Māori claim, uh, that hadn't quite happened, and uh, that claim was very much a, um, a contemporary policy claim, complaining that you know, the Māori language had been subverted, undermined, suppressed, oppressed, and that something needed to be done about it. And it kind of opened my eyes to some important things about the way the tribunal operated and what its great value was. 
because government departments turned up to explain what they were doing about Te Reo Māori or not doing about Te Reo Māori during that, during that process. Komatua from all over the country came, you know, the great leaders really of the Māori world in those days. Um, uh, who were they? Bill Orhia, my uncle Bill Orhia, Koro Jews, Sid Mead, the Reverend Māori Marsden, He Nare Tu Whāngai, Sir James, Lat- uh, Sir James He Nare, all came along and explained that they had themselves been beaten for speaking Māori and that um, something needed to be done to redress that imbalance. It was, it was an amazing experience because here were all of these old Māori people, male and female, speaking truth to power, I guess, is what they were doing, and power having to respond. You know, and in those days, that was actually a revolutionary thing. The idea that the state would consider that it was required to answer to and be accountable for what it had done uh, with respect to te reo, in a quasi-judicial tribunal involving a judge, uh, a knight of the realm and a QC, was an amazing kind of, I don't know, an equalizing experience that I'd never seen before. And it was something of the magic, showed me something of the magic of the tribunal. And it showed me why, most particularly over the decade that followed from 85 to 95, the calls for accountability moved from the streets to the Waitangi Tribunal's hearing rooms. It, it built confidence, we should say, and you uh, will help us here with the details. 1985 was also the time when the tri- tribunal moved from being able to consider only the contemporary claims to being able to consider the historic claims, the very context that you talk about. And that was a very robust debate that led to that decision. Sure was. But did this first claim build confidence that this tribunal could become the forum by which genuine redress could be achieved and, and could be heard. I, I think that's exactly what it was. The, uh, in, these, in those early hearings, Mutunui, Kaituna, the Orake claim, which the tribunal heard, I think, even before it had retrospective jurisdictions, jurisdiction, and the Te Reo Māori claim showed two really important things. One, the Māori world had confidence in this tribunal because they turned up, and not just, not just any old Māori, but all of the big leaders turned up to these hearings to speak truth to power. And the second thing was the government and the Pākehā world cared what that tribunal thought, because it was in the papers, you saw with Mutunui, it actually changed um, a, a matter of core government policy, Uh, It was in the papers, people were interested, Uh, Parliament was talking about it. The power system knew to respect a judicial panel, if you like, knew that its job was to respect that, that panel, and liked the idea that this minority that had been disempowered for so long had bought into it. What do you saw some of the consequences of that first? Uh, the, the broadcasting um, rights that, that were to flow, uh, the evolution of the Tekohanga uh, rail movement and others. Uh, uh, again, did it take time to see what, from this first case, what could genuinely be given in effect? Most of these things had already started, that the Kohanga Reo movement was just at its beginnings. In fact, I remember the tribunal going to the Kohanga Reo across the road at Waifetu and seeing these little kids, and there's this great photo in the newspaper in the Dom, I remember, as a, you know, I'm, well, I was a kid in my 20s, my early 20s, um, seeing the three tribunal members sitting there in this kohanga reo with these little brown kids crawling all over them um, and, and reporting to New Zealand that te reo Māori was alive and kicking and was resurging. So, so the tribunal was sitting at the same time that these other fires were getting lit uh, te Reo Pōneke, the first Māori language radio station, had been in operation, I think, during Māori language week the year before. 
I know I, I, I did the children's show, <laughs> um, and um, my very dear friend Ngāhiwi Apanui did the, um, did the youth section because he, he knew all the cool music and so on and so forth. None of us ever got paid for these things, but it was, it was a time when, when the Māori world was starting to light up. And the tribunal, um, the tribunal took that to the mainstream and gave it credibility so that these things were no longer seen as peripheral, or starting to no longer be seen as peripheral developments, but developments that were affecting the core of who we were. I mean, that would take 20 years, but that's ultimately what happened. Where did this, or, 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 or to where did this go? Because I think by the end of the 1990s, you were into a very significant year as a claimant lawyer. And what sparked forth from this? Did you begin to see the individual claims, the individual histories, the individual mobilisation of others taking, or, or taking advantage of the wrong word, um, using this institution to bring forth their stories, their claims, and to seek justice? So the next big shift is from really, the, I guess, the late 80s, through to the late 90s where the historical treaty settlement process really kicks off. And the tribunal, certainly in the first two-thirds of that time, um, becomes the core driver of that process. And the tribunal would travel around to communities all over the country, sit in the communities, in the meeting houses, in the whare nui, eat with the, um, with the claimants and Crown Council in the whare kai, um, weeks often of hearings where the local people would recount their recollections of historical wrongs, would recite their mana, would parade their young people to show that they'd still survived, would parade the strength of their tikanga whatever that might have been, to demonstrate, actually to celebrate that they hadn't disappeared all over the country, uh, from the bottom of the south all the way to the top of the north. Uh, and I was involved in lots of those claims. My first one was the Te Rorua claim, which was infamous, I guess, because it involved a piece of private land uh, north of Dargaville being claimed, private farmland being claimed, by the claimants because it was Wahitapa, it was a burial ground, a place called Manu Fetai at Maunui Bluff. Um, and from there to Muri Whenua, uh, the Muri Whenua land claims, um, the Ngāwha geothermal claim, the Hauraki tribal claims, the Tauranga tribal claims, uh, Ngāti Kahungunu, Ahuriri, um, many others. Just a sense of the different ex experiences for you as a lawyer and of the people in these situations. You mentioned that Te Rorua was a, what, what we call a fairly small claim. Not, not small to them though. And, and in different settings and with different communities and different histories. What were the different kinds of experiences that you came to witness and to help bear witness to? One thing that there are kind of too many stories to tell, um, and in the retelling, they, the stories get better and better. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that struck me about my first... I was just a kid during the Te, Te Rorua claim. David Baragwanath called me. I didn't know who the hell David Baragwanath was, but I was fresh out of law school, just got back from British Columbia, um, and, of course, considered that I was the saviour. <laughs> Uh, and David Baragwanath called me and said, I've got a claim, I really don't want to do it, would you mind doing it? And I sort of said, well, just give me a second to think about that. Yes! <laughs> and took this claim and got to meet this, got to know this community. Three communities in Kaihu, in the Waipoa Forest, and in the Waimamaku Valley, all along that coast, of, that coast between Kaipara and Hokianga. And, you know, I've kind of fell in love with those communities and still keep very close to them. Uh, but these were people, the people in the Waipoa Forest, for example, had to drive across private roads. They had no legal access to their community. Uh, across private roads for 25 minutes to get to the nearest electricity. And there were 
people in the community, probably in their early 60s when I was working there, and around 1989, 1990, who uh, didn't start school till they were 16. I remember one, and not just one or two, the lot. And they, you know, they, they spoke, they weren't. You know, these were people in their 60s, not in their 80s or 90s. And their English was appalling. Their Māori was exquisite, taitokero, ngāpuhi Māori. I remember one kaumātua telling a story to the tribunal um, about going to school when he was 16 and they'd, they'd, they were made to take their auntie to be the interpreter because none of them could speak English and neither could their auntie. <laughs> <laughs> so she sat there and took the, took the scones and the cup of tea but couldn't say anything. And, and they had these, they had these you know, what we all remember as kids, you know, they have these pictures of... Um, things that start with the correct letter of the alphabet, so it'd be A for apple and B for boat and C for cat and so on, all around, you know, we all remember these things, all around in the, the, the kind of the upper wall of the classroom. And the teacher was going through, he said, teacher was going through getting each of the kids to explain what A, you know, what A is for what and B is for what and C is for what. And dear old Boise Birch, who was the coolest old crow, um, got, got to, um, got... S is for snake, and Boise could see this coming. And he, he, he started to sweat, he said, because he had no idea what a snake was. Um, and he, he said, he, he, he looked up at the teacher, the teacher said, S is for, S is for, and he said, S is for tuna. Because <laughs> he thought it must have been an eel, and he didn't know what eel was, so he tried tuna. And of course he got sent home. <laughs> so, you know, one of the, the great joys of my 30 years, as you remind me, um, working with these communities was getting to know the people and hearing the real stories of, you know, the, the real stories of people engaging with modernity. Uh, you know, from the old people in, say, the Murifenwa land claim, uh, the old people in their 80s lived genuine Neolithic lives. They talked to me, I remember um, Machu, Makali Machu talking to me about what would happen when a whale washed up on 90 Mile Beach. The whole village would go down and the chief, Makali then is a young man, the chief would say, okay, Te Kao, you get that side, Ahipara, you get that side, and they would carve it up. And each village would take a section of this whale away and, they'd, and he explained how they used different things for different purposes, for lighting, for food, and... You know, it's kind of another world. What were some of the principles being established in some of these cases, some of the jurisprudence, if you will, that was being developed? For example, what was, the, what was at the heart of the Muda Whenua claim and, and, and what was established there the tribunal process? So uh, at the heart of the Muda Whenua land claim was these two worlds that I was, talk I was talking about in, in, in a modern context where the old people had really transited into modernity and it asked that question about the period of first contact. What was the nature of the land transactions prior to the treaty between 1834, I think the first transaction in Muri Whenua, and 1840, uh, where settlers came and were given land in exchange for gifts? Uh, were those contracts for the final transfer of blocks of land, or were they these things that in Tikanga Māori were called tuku whenua? So that, that, that was kind of the platform upon which the tribunal was asked the big question about what happens when two worlds meet, and whose law governs that meeting. And what is a contract? And what is a contract? It's different, potentially, in, in the eyes of each of the participants. Right, so this is a long time ago, but I remember... Um, some of the evidence being, for example, that there would be uh, a written contract giving up the land forever and ever in exchange for some half a dozen Jews' harps and several blankets and um, literally and um, uh, iron tools and so on, axes in particular. Um, and the chiefs would sign their mark, including the leading chief in the area, Panakareau. Uh, they would sign their mukos. And then a week later, when the settlers had cut down some trees in what the locals said was a wahitapu, they'd go in and sack the settlers' houses. And you know, 
exert, execute muru on them for breaching tikanga Māori, for breaching Māori law. Um, and, you know, a, a, a month later or six months later or two years later, they'd come back and ask for some more. And, of course, on one view of it, certainly the settlers' view of it, this was just extortion. They, they paid their dues and they had the land. And from a Māori point of view, this was kind of obvious tikanga. The whole point in the transaction was to create a relationship with these settlers and to maintain that relationship, they had to be continued giving from one to the other, both sides exchanging gifts as they went, often the Māori leaders exchanging um, females in order to lock the new settlers into the community. So, you know, in many ways, the, the two worlds couldn't have been more different on the values they brought to that transaction. So it was a, it was a, it was a beautiful symbol of the work the tribunal was doing right throughout the country. As a lawyer, in these cases, what would you bring to bear? Obviously the history and the telling of the story is a very important part of the process, but you are there as a lawyer arguing a claim and arguing ultimately for some kind of redress. On what would that be based? Was it drawn, for example, by your experience in, in, in studying and working in other uh, indigenous uh, historical environments overseas? How would you form your cases? One of the difficult things about being a lawyer in the tribunal, particularly about being a claimant lawyer, and particularly in those early days, was that you had yourself to operate in two worlds. Because you had to do your job as a lawyer, you had to set up the evidence correctly to make sure that you um, hit the points you needed to hit in order to get the quantum that ultimately you'd be able to get when you sat down and negotiated with Wellington. But in the meantime, you had to deal with a community you had a completely different idea of what was going on. I remember, um, it's a great story, I remember David Baraguana telling me that during the fisheries claims up in Muri Whenua again, uh, the, um, he was cross-examining a fisheries officer about you know, what, a, what a terrible thing the quota management system was and how it was going to be uh, stealing Māori fishing rights, and David said that he, um, he really took this guy up, just eviscerated him, apparently, according to David. <laughs> and he was feeling very pleased with himself for having done it. And at the end of his, at the, at the morning break, and he was about to go on and really, you know, really deliver the coup de grace. Uh, but at the morning break, this lovely queer came up to him and said, we stop that. This is our marae. You're not supposed to attack our manuhiri on our marae. You be respectful. David, what? Why aren't they, you know, why aren't I being carried out on a, on a shield of victory? And um, David said he never forgot that, that lesson about the different ways in which these two communities, these two systems of values and of law, thought about the way they were going through this process. And that, that was exactly my experience. I remember in one claim, um, the, lawyer, the lawyer for the Crown happened to have his birthday on, on a particular day in front of a tribunal. And the claimants, you know, who, whose land had been torn from them, baked him a cake <laughs> and sung him happy birthday in Māori and in English. You know, cause it, it was all, even now, even... You know, even ten generations since that first meeting of the settlers and the Māoris up in Muri Whenua, to start from where I started from, even now it was all about the relationship. It wasn't about the battle. And, you know, I've always, I've always respected that. How personal has this process been at times for you? And while it's been a professional career and undoubtedly a, a personal passion... Uh, it, it has become very personal, the tauranga, the hauraki inquiries. This is a time where, uh, as I understand it, these are places you, you come from, you have connections to, this is part of your own personal history. And How did you experience those claims? Well, it, was a, it was a great privilege to do um, three particular claims, three particular tribal claims. The hauraki claim, where I come from, Tuturu, I'm from a little village called Manaya, south of 
Coromandel, which if you blink, you will miss. Um, the Tauranga claims, because I also come from Ngāti Pūkengaki Tauranga, and my second village is at Welcome Bay in a place called Ngāpeke. And the Ahudidi claims, because I'd grown up in Hastings and so knew all the people and all the marais from that area. So each of those was kind of a, a personal walk back through history from an entirely different perspective. Because I knew these people well, I'd grown up with them and not thought of them as, never thought of them as clients and never, probably never really seen the depth that was there uh, among them until I called upon them to tell their stories. And, you know, the stories were extra always extraordinarily powerful. I remember one um, <clears throat> in Tauranga, uh, one hapu was um, giving evidence of loss as a result of the confiscations in that area. They lost almost all of their land in that area, Ngāti Hangara. Um, and they, during, the, um, during a site visit, we were taken to a place where the old people said that during the wars, the women, children, and the old, well, actually not all the women, because a number of the women were fighting, but the old people, some of the women, and all of the children were taken up into the bush to hide until gate pa was done, until the fighting was done. And then later on, until Orako was done, the, um, the fight at which the people would, were beaten. They'd, they'd won Gate Pa and um, dealt to the, the British Imperial troops and then been themselves defeated, uh, not at Orako, but at um, the name of a pa that has jumped out of my memory. At Teranga, thank you. Thank you, at Teranga. Um, anyway, so we came back to the their marae and sat down and these people sang a song, a beautiful old waiata called Te Tangiata Kiriti. And it was a waiata about uh, Te Tangi Mo Te Kiriti. It was, a, it, was a, it was a waiata composed by the wife of Te Kiriti who had fought at Teranga. She was waiting up in the bush in the Kaimais along with the community for her husband to get to come back and the fighters, the story was told on the marae, uh, the fighters came back in dribs and drabs. And by dark, it was clear that the Kennedy wasn't coming back. He'd been killed. And so this kuya composes on the spot this waiata for te, this tangi mo te kiriti, a lament for te kiriti, telling him off for doing what he'd done and now, you know, now what's, now what? I'm a widow and um, I'm bereft and I loved you and I'm lost. So it's a beautiful, beautiful way of it. The whole village sings it, well, young people and old. And it's kind of a, um, it's a cathartic moment in the, in the Ngāti Amaro claim. It, and they're all crying, old people and young people all crying in the whanenui as they re-sing the lament for the karete, for the kiriti. And the crown's crying. And the tribunal's crying too. And I always thought that was, you know, this is a, this is a process of such extraordinary power that the, the one who must answer for the oppressor the descendants of the oppressed and the judges all shared physically in the pain of that little hapu as they recounted the song of their ancestress. And at the end of that, I was feeling pretty pleased because I was their lawyer and um, uh, they'd really nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing was, at the end of it, you know, because I'd spent weeks beforehand working with the people as to what they might say. And if you've ever been a claimant lawyer, boy, that's hard work because it's like herding Maori cats. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of it, you couldn't help seeing that the people were a bit taller than they were beforehand and that the old ones 
had this kind of zing about them that they hadn't had before. I mean, I, maybe it's just my own optimism, maybe it's my naive, wishful thinking, but to me that was completely palpable. You could really see it. And others, including my junior, young junior, Spencer Webster, um, could see it too. Let's talk about redress, though, because there is the stage of bringing the story, telling the story, the weeping, as you say, that is part of the process. But there is also settlement, redress. Now, as tribunal chairperson from 1999, you'd seen a fair bit by then, as we said. You'd been in the, uh, in the arena since 1985. Where things got to by then, what did you see as chairman of the tribunal, what did you seek to achieve to refine the process, or particularly to see the process of appearing and the case being brought and the claim being heard, in inverted commas, to convert that into practical redress and, and results. Right, so um, achieving catharsis was one thing, and in all of the claims that I was involved in, there was always at least one and usually more than one cathartic moment that kind of, that was the signature for that particular claim. Um, but one thing that the process was really bad at was getting things done in time for the old people still to be alive when the settlement was done, getting through that process. And when I took on the role first as acting chair and then um, when Eddie Jury uh, resigned, I think, in 2004 to concentrate on his work as a high court judge, um, one thing that I, I, really, I really wanted to make a legacy issue was that the, was to get the process to be completed before the old ones that led it passed on. So we developed a slightly more structured way of dealing with the issues and the claim, settling issues beforehand, requiring proper statements of claim and so on. I, mean, I understood that there were some risks in that. You, you, you don't frankly want to parkify the process too much or you take away its magic. But on the other hand, you don't want to have to pay with a generation for the for the for the kind of cultural um, sensitivity of the process. So we tried to strike that balance and we developed a, a kind of new process, which I think is, generally speaking, still in operation. Still not perfect and the process still takes a long time. But I have to say, compared with equivalent processes in cognate jurisdictions around the world, it's still, I think, the most effective striking of the balance between those two important values. Was the Tūranga claim an example of how you tried to give effect to this? Well, the Tūranga claim was an experiment <laughs> where, we, where, we, um, where we tried to um, get it done within a, within a reasonable, get the work done within a reasonable time frame. Um, and those people who, who are here who were involved in that claim will know we didn't quite uh, hit our targets. Um, but to, uh, you know, I'm pleased the Tūranga claims are now settled. They were settled reasonably promptly. And there's some price to pay in that because negotiations are a tough business and they put a great deal of stress on communities. More stress, actually, than the claims process because you're having to make decisions about who gets the right to speak and who doesn't. Tough decisions, final decisions... They're always controversial and not everyone will be on board. So, um, so you know, I guess by mid nine, by, by 2000, the early 2000s on, the Waitangi Tribunal and the Office of Treaty Settlements got down, and the claimant communities all throughout the country, got down to the tough and sometimes dirty business of negotiating their way through treaty claims where there are no structures in place. It's the thing we forget. Unlike Canada, the US, um, even Australia, there are no formal structures in place that, prior to this that could be the spokespeople for communities in their treaty settlements. The claimants had to construct these edifices from zero because they hadn't ever been recognised in New Zealand, hadn't been recognised in New Zealand law probably since before 1865 in the Native Land Court. So 
there was a lot of reinventing being done and a great deal of bruising and pain and suffering. But um, I think uh, most of the players in the process will tell you that the cohesion and goodwill got people over the line time and time again, much to everybody's surprise, I must say. Uh, and I saw a particular role of the tribunal in that process, not just of speeding up the process, but of acting as an independent accountability mechanism to give the people who didn't quite fit in the box, or the people who wanted to test whether the decision-making was right, a place to go. Because the mainstream courts wouldn't touch this with a barge pole. Like an ombudsman. Kind of like a treaty ombudsman, yeah. And I, uh, during that decade from 2000 on, and still, in my view, the tribunal has had a crucial role in keeping the process as clean as it can be, given that it's a human process and an untidy one. And it sits underneath not only a legal, but a political umbrella. And there's a couple of... Uh, I should say, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to open for questions fairly soon. If you have questions for the judge, I think you've, I think you've agreed to take some questions. Sure, sure. <laughs> uh, I certainly have some. Um, but... but <laughs> some of the changes that occurred... In, in the time of that, of that chair, chairmanship, one, for example, the amending of the Act in 2006 to impose a deadline for the registering of historical claims. This was from September 2008. I think it was to take effect. Did, you, did that dovetail nicely with what you were trying to lead within the tribunal, which is without indecent haste, I think is a phrase you've used before, build momentum, can we get moving? Did it, did it dovetail with that? Is it something you can comment on or not comment on? Um, I'm not, I'm, in some ways, the, the, that change in 2006 with the deadline, it was 2008, wasn't it? it? Took effect, I think, in... 2008? Yes, September. And Only new claims that could be registered were ones relating to Crown actions later than 1992. I should know that. Hmm. Um, it probably had the opposite effect to what it was hoped to have, and that is that it created a Cambrian explosion of claims um, as everybody tried to get their claims in. So in some ways it probably made the job a little bit more difficult than leaving it to, to the organic processes of, of both tribal and Wellington poly, politics. Um, but it, it, it hasn't been, it wasn't a fatal change. Uh, and both the Māori world and the Wellington world learned to cope with it. The other um, matter that I wanted to address was, well, well, they're twofold again. One is that alongside what has happened over these decades with the tribunal, there has been the growing of uh, direct negotiations with the Crown. I think, again, in a political environment that was um, uh, definitely uh, seen as a way forward by the, the, the Labour government, in particular, uh, of Michael Cullen's era. And you mentioned earlier the fisheries settlement, which again was outside, strictly outside of the, of the of negotiation process, outside of the tribunal process. In some ways, was the whole tribunal process a catalyst for these? Did it begin the conversations between the parties? Did it begin an acceptance within the wider public that this was a process that needed to happen? Again, can you observe with, with treaty process sits within that wider context? Well, I think you're dead right. That's precisely what uh, role the tribunal played in fisheries. It started in Ngaitahu and in Muri Whenua, uh, and ultimately led to Aboriginal t rights or Aboriginal title claims being lodged um, in the courts and then the Great Fisheries Settlement of 92. Um, uh, so, and, and, of course, the shift generally from the tribunal now... Into, to the negotiating table for many, if not most, claimants. It's exceptional now for claimants to say, look, we don't want to negotiate, we'd rather litigate. Some, some do, and of course that's got to be respected. But that outcome, that shift to negotiation, is not something that uh, was unpredicted. Um, Eddie Jury was predicting it in his time as, um, as chairperson, and was a great fan of it, as was I. So Process, that's right, that's people, right. Once some benchmarks got set, yes. you didn't necessarily need to go to the tribunal to rehearse stuff unless you needed that for the purposes of the cohesion of your own community. 
It and often that was the case. It occurs to me the comment that you made at the very outset about that very first claim as a young lawyer, that it was two things. You said you know, speaking truth to power, but also those who'd been disempowered speaking to the powerful. Now they're negotiating directly with right. the powerful. And that seems to be a, a symbol of the, of the maturation of the process. I think that's precisely right. And in my view, it is a healthy symbol. The shift to the negotiating table from the hearing room um, it's been gradual, it hasn't been too rushed, it's been, been natural, and it's been a matter of choice for most claimants. Um, and to the extent that that is the case, I think it's shown, miraculously, that New Zealand can do this stuff. Probably, in my view, better than anywhere else. Another matter that pertains back to, um, I mean, this is partly me raising these matters because it was when I was, in, from the political perspective, observing pretty close to the environment, and we're talking about the contemporary claims here, and we must actually, uh, we must not neglect one of the big ones, Y262. Um, but the oil and gas claim, I recall, uh, the treaty report coming out, you'll remember this well, and I think within hours, if not minutes, the government had said that's not going to happen. So again, without leading you into hot water. Um, hot oil. <laughs> the contemporary claims, were they treated differently? Was it a different experience? In some ways, was a, a, a testing of the boundaries. I can think of others a, a, as well, a testing of the boundaries. And can you comment on the way they unfolded and perhaps some of the reaction to them? Well, the tr tribunal initially was only a modern policy tribunal. It, and then it shifted in '85 to becoming primarily a, an historical claims tribunal with um, a small proportion of its work uh, being contemporary policy and small by practical, for practical reasons, there just wasn't enough resource to throw at this compared with the great work of historical claims. Um, you know, during the, uh, the decades prior to 2000, the tribunal's contemporary claims jurisdiction was very much about getting Wellington to notice because there were very few pathways into the beehive for the tribes or for you know, the Māori Council or whatever it might be to get contemporary issues raised. And the tribunal became the platform upon which Māori communities, Māori groups and tribes spoke to Pōneke about policy. Once you got into the 21st century and the proliferation of Māori engagement in mainstream politics, you know, 20 Māori MPs in a parliament of 120 odd on average, that role I expect became less important because access to power was more direct. It's not to say it's unimportant, but it was crucially important in Motunui. If it hadn't been for the tribunal, the planning tribunal already said we're not interested in your spiritual evidence on on your reefs, I'm sorry, it's irrelevant under the planning legislation. There was no other way in. So that tribunal was about, simply about speaking truth to power uh, in a way that power had to listen. Whether, that's, whether that role is as important in the 21st century is probably a question that's worth debating. Why 262? Surely one of the most far-reaching and in many ways the most complex, colloquially known as the Indigenous flora and fauna, and also cultural and intellectual property claim. Your comments, your experience of this particular claim. Um, so that, I have to say, the y two, I, I came to the Y262 claim late because the presiding officer passed away, and it had been on the books and being heard for some time, and I had to step in um, because I was chairperson at the time and no one else would put their hand up. Um, it was a cool claim because uh, these again were communities asking the question about the place of their values, their beliefs, their systems in our overall policy settings. The place of te reo, the place of tikanga in uh, IP, in um, environmental law. You know, the, the, the general big questions that you don't get to ask very often, uh, by people who were ordinary people on the ground doing the work, doing
doing the conservation work, writing haka, tattooing, you know, tamokoing each other. Real Māoris um, arguing for the protection of the things of value to their culture. Um, so, it, and, and you know, we travelled across the country for quite a long time listening to those sorts of people talking about that sort of issue. Um, so it was one of the great privileges to be able to chair the Y262 Tribunal. You now sit in the High Court, a very different jurisdiction, it's a criminal court. Do you see, reflecting on, as we said, these three decades, reflecting on all the changes we haven't even talked, you talked about the, the, the clash earlier of, of the Māori and the Pākehā worlds back in that very significant early claim of yours, but we haven't even really talked about where Pākehā have come an acceptance of the process, been the ups and downs, it's been the foreshore and seabed, what I like to call primal scream. Um, but, but now as you reflect back on where we've come as a society, where you reflect on where Māori have come, do you have a perspective from where you sit now in your new role about the significance of the Waitangi Tribunal? Um, I, I, I view life from a very different perspective now. My professional life is a as a judge, maybe 40%, maybe a half of my work is uh, crime and sentencing. Uh, sentencing in particular an extraordinarily burdensome task for any judge, and I'm no exception to that. Um, so I've often reflected on the connection between what happened a century ago and more, and what's happening now. And uh, I think the can be no argument that the losses that claimants that appeared before me and clients that I acted for over those 30 years, the losses that occurred during that 19th century period speak to us still in the disconnection, the dysfunction and the anger of the current generation of young Māori and the inordinate burden that they come to place on our system of criminal justice and family protection. Not the only cause, there are many others, but that loss, whether you were loyalist or rebel, whether you were quiet or loud in that time, those losses speak powerfully and speak still. But we've come a long way, I think. We've come a long, the Māori world has come a long way in terms of reconstructing itself. And the Pākehā and other cultures world has come a long way too in recognising and then embracing key aspects of that culture. I was thinking about what we might talk about today after hearing a long and... Um, tough tax appeal. Um, and today, all of the court openings and closings, every jurisdiction throughout the country, are in Māori. Uh, um, and the, the, the registrars say, Kia rite, mo te kai whakawao te kui ni e tūkua. Silence all stand for his or her honour, the Queen's judge, if you're in the High Court. And when they adjourn, they say, Kwa heki te koti e tu kwa. The Court will adjourn, please stand. Everywhere. I know because in the High Court, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, I trained the staff. <laughs> and the judges are as a result of a policy decision of the Institute for Judicial Studies, now on a course where, they, where it is compulsory for them to do a course in tikanga Māori. And, I mean, technically it's compulsory, but actually they're beating down the door to get to the course because the level of goodwill uh, among the mainstream judiciary, I'm not talking about the Māori Land Court and the Waitangi Tribunal, among the mainstream judiciary in terms of solving what appear to be intractable problems that we've inherited is extraordinary in my experience. Uh, and much, I must say, much better than I expected when I moved from the specialist Māori jurisdiction into the mainstream. So times are tough, but 
I'm optimistic. I think we might well have an answer that over the next decade or so might unlock this. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Kia ora. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a microphone, two in fact, and we have a handsome dear that's now running with them. If anyone would like to um, go and put it down. If anyone would like to sing a song, one over, Dean. One over there. Yeah. If anyone would like to ask questions, please, would you raise your hand? Um, the judge is very happy to take them. Completely covered off 40 years of colonial history. <laughs> At the back, please. Thank you, Dean. At the back. Thank you for that. Um, I'd be really interested in you talking about how the government could do its processes better to really invite meaningful consultation and stories when it goes out with ideas that actually create a forum to do, much like what you were talking about, your experience of changing the process with the tribunal? Or maybe examples of where you think the government has done that well or could improve? Um. Um, what could I say about that? Probably nothing that, um, that is particularly helpful. I mean, I've, over the years I've seen, I've seen engagement with Māori communities work and work really well. And I've seen engagement go badly because it's not particularly meaningful nor intended to be particularly meaningful. And all the Māori communities I know can smell token consultation at about 10 miles. Um, so, what, look, I, I reckon I, uh, the best thing I could say is, is this. What's changed o over the, this genera in this generation? <laughs> is that government has got much smarter at doing this stuff than it used to be you know, when I was a young lawyer working with communities. That doesn't always mean that it will produce the right result. It doesn't always mean that the consultation is meaningful. Um, but as far as I can see, it's more thoughtful, um, more sensitive, more culturally sensitive, and it gets the Māori world better than it ever has since probably, I don't know, 1870. And I think, personally, I'm grateful for that. Best answer I can give you. Sir, thank you. Joe, firstly, no, thank you for all that you have done and your huge contribution during your professional uh, career and... Uh, follow with interest from uh, your various roles that you've had, but one thing I was going to ask you just from your perspective, just to actually take advantage and to assist uh, the, the treaty settlement process after the settlement has been completed and uh, legislation passed and assets uh, transferred, etc., and I'm talking probably about smaller Māori groups, what do you think the Crown can actually do to assist that process? And I'm thinking about things like strategic plans and, and governance, and I know there's the pride of the, of, of the Māori leaders and as a result of achieving a long uh, and difficult settlement, but how can that be done in the right way where perhaps there's some further support to ensure that the hard-earned uh, um, compensation they've received can be used for the benefit of the beneficiaries moving forward? Yes, well, um, we're, in a, we're in a period where there's a, where there's a skill deficit amongst Māori communities, particularly the smaller Māori communities. And, of course, the settlements aren't large. They're 2 3 4% of the loss. So they're unlikely to be able to 
Um, the, the, the amount of uh, time that's available, the amount of resources available to upskill, the amount of free board available for mistakes is really limited. We see with, say, you know, the loss of Nati Tama's uh, treaty settlement uh, a few years ago. Mistakes will be costly because the putea, the, the, the settlement uh, corpus, is very small. So, not just in this area, but generally in the area of utilization of Māori land as well, Māori communities really need mentors and skill upgraders working with them to assist them in simple things that business understands but communities don't, like strategic planning. Um, time and time again as a Māori land court judge, I ran into communities, Fano and Hapu, who had all the best will in the world but no real idea about how to, um, how to engage with the assets they held and grow them and utilize them for the benefit of their communities or even the opportunity to think about what benefit might mean for a Māori community as opposed to a general community. So there's, I think, an enormous um, need for what you have talked about too. And one of my great fears is that the smaller settlements will be lost because there's only room for one mistake. So we have to be watchful. That may, the danger is that will unpick the durability of the whole process. We can't afford that. Uh, thank you for an interesting talk. I'm just wondering what you think about um, the future role of the tribunal, and particularly once um, historical claims are settled and that process is concluded. Um, do you think it's the best body to deal with contemporary claims going into the future? I've heard some suggestion that perhaps a parliamentary commissioner for the treaty might be an alternative model where you can sort of nimbly respond to when the government's um, committed a breach of the treaty. So can you comment on that? Recommended that in Y262? Maybe not. Um, you know, I think in due course, the one thing we have to get to in this country is the treaty normalised. It's just an ordinary part of our... Actually, we're not that far off that. Uh, when you look at the number of areas in which the treaty speaks, or Māori issues speak usually as a result of some statutory provision that says they must. Um, over time, the need for an independent body to speak truth to power will diminish. And I think that's a natural process, and I don't think we need to be afraid of it. I go up to Waitangi to take the Chief Justice on to the tea. Um, and to present the judiciary for the iwi to, um, to inspect. And I'm struck that annually now almost the entire cabinet visits at Waitangi and gives an account of itself to the forum of tribal chiefs gathered there. You know, even during the 1840s and 50s, I don't think we would have seen that. Even when the Māori position was at its strongest, I don't think we would have seen that. And yet it's a change that we barely notice. and certainly don't think it's strange. So, so much has changed in how, um, how business is transacted now between Māori communities and the government across a broad range of things. So in time, it'll be time to put the Waitangi Tribunal to bed, I think, and if it's done properly, that will be a good thing. And I think one of the important changes that ought to occur at that point is that the Treaty of Waitangi becomes at least a part of the ordinary law of this country. And you can go to a High Court judge and say, my rights under the treaty have been breached. Please give me redress. Ed is our law, uh, our judge made law, our, our, or, or, or uh, precedent set in the tribunal, decisions made at the tribunal. 
How prepared is our system, indeed our judiciary, for that day? Um, well, I mentioned that um, judges are doing courses in Tikanga now, a three-day marae-based course, two-and-a-half-day marae-based course, um, where we talk about basic ideas of Māori law um, and learn from um, people expert in these things, Māori lawyers in the Māori world, uh, who are not any of them lawyers in the uh, Pākehā world. Um, and that, you know, that, that's a process that's going to take some time to go through. But increasingly, it hasn't happened yet, and there's still lots of work to do, but increasingly, this stuff is becoming normal in what we do. And I can, you, you can read family court judgments now that talk about whanaungatanga. You can, talk, you can read environment court judges that apply in nuanced and sophisticated ways the idea of kaitiakitana. Um, you can see sentencing judges referring to the hapu background, the mana of the people who are supporting a prisoner who is being sentenced. I mean, it's not, it's not every day, but it's there, and it's growing momentum. And I think you know, one thing is that the way we do stuff in this country is we don't do it with great eloquent elegant sweeps. We do it with little incremental steps and we take ten forward and five back and three sideways and and you know the the, the generate the last generation of treaty claims teaches us that works for us. And I think this next phase is us completely normalizing the treaty and the Māori community in the life of the country. The lady first and then the gentleman. Tēnā koe te kai whakawā, uh, i tau toko ana hau i ngā mihi kua mihia, kia koe, uh, nei rā hoki wā māua nei mihi. Um, Tōku pātai, sir, I'm aware of and being involved in um, educators and people from different sectors and other indigenous communities and countries coming to New Zealand to learn of Māori, um, you know, learning about the kohanga reo and, and the, how we've retained our reo um, and, and that sort of process. I'm interested to know if any sort of similar conversations has happened with um, other bars and ju um, the judiciary from other nations where they're, they're also, well, I don't know if they're actually considering it, but how they might be able to put in place a process similar to here or, or something that works for them that will help them bring two worlds together, an Indigenous world and a Western world. Has, have those sorts of conversations occurred? Yes, they have. In fact, um, a couple of years ago at the... Um the World Indigenous Lawyers Conference at Waikato. There was a big contingent of um, Aboriginal lawyers um, who came and shared ideas. And uh, the following year, a big contingent of Māori lawyers went to Brisbane to do the, the same thing at the, at the next conference. Maybe it was two years later. Every, every country, every ex-colonial country, every post-colonial country has this, these issues to deal with and deals with them in their own way. Um, in the past, there has not been enough exchange between uh, lawyers engaged in indigenous issues in the various jurisdictions. And that's been, I think, um, a cost here as well as in those other places. I don't think we have all the answers by any means. Uh, there are lots of things we could learn from the way um, Aboriginal people in Canada in particular, it's a very similar jurisdiction in some ways. Uh, in Australia, Hawaii, very similar culturally. Um, how those places deal with the issues that we're trying to deal with here. I mean, I've, I've kind of talked up our exceptionalism, because in part I believe it, but we're not that exceptional that we can't learn from people in similar circumstances, and we probably should do more of that. And then, if anyone else uh, has really got a burning one, could you raise your hand? But gentleman at the back, thank you. Um, kia ora matua. Uh, tēnā koe mō, mō kōrero. Hey, um, just touching on what you were talking about in terms of normalising um, you know, knowledge of the treaty, um, the kind of it appears that that kind of special knowledge of the treaty um, that you've just mentioned doesn't really come to a lawyer or a law student until after they've left law school. So my question is, what do you think 
law schools can do um, to help um, you know, kind of normalise that knowledge before they venture off the law system. Can you use that your time? <laughs> You know, as you were talking, I was thinking, brother, you're lucky. <laughs> Ken Keith was teaching me in, in 1980, mumble, mumble. Um, <laughs> I think he was the only teacher in my entire degree who ever mentioned the treaty. And in, Oh, okay, well, they'd obviously learned that that was a mistake by the, <laughs> by the 80s. Um, and now, of course, the, the treaty is a is, I think, a fundamental aspect in the degree. Um, what I'd love to see more in the law schools is the treatment of tikanga as law. The idea that, um, that whanaunga tanga, that tapu, that utu, kaitiaki tanga, these are legal ideas and legal principles properly belonging to a law degree. And I know that you know, there's some movement in that area. But the next big shunt forward, I think, is in us understanding that the system of law we operate in this country, this unique country, in its unique circumstances, is actually a dual system of law. If you read the Care of Children Act, Guardianship Act, uh, Children and Young Persons Act, um, Resource Management Act, Patents Act, Trademarks Act, uh, and so on and so on, the Sentencing Act, you will see Māori law embedded in the relevant provisions. Not even talking about cases like Takamori, where there's no legal, no, no, no statutory basis, but a common law basis for the recognition of tikanga. We've barely scratched the surface of that area, and it's going to be an exciting period going forward as we start to work that. Now, you talking about this as like common law principles that have become New Zealand common law principles, or do you see a need for some kind of statute intervention, or how would this develop legally? So what happens in New Zealand is we do most things by statute. It's a kind of trademark in, in this country. Yeah. It does, and politicians. <laughs> um, and, and a lot of principles of Māori law have be, actually been enacted into various statutes, whether the lawmakers knew they were doing it or not. Um, but in the spaces between those provisions are areas uh, in which the common law can develop stand alone without statutory underpinning. And the Takamori case is, of course, the famous modern example of that. But what that means is if you look across, if you look across the spectrum of our law, there are actually very few areas in which te Māori do not speak. Judges are only just becoming aware of that, mainstream judges. And law schools are only just becoming aware of that. The Māori community, particularly now resourced up, um, re-tribalised, reconnected, newly cohesive, um, is taking that you know, several steps forward with the rest of the system traipsing along behind. But over the next decade, I think, that'll be the next kind of challenge. As we build, I think, um, that's my last point, as we build inevitably an entirely unique system of law that works here and only here. Anyone else really needs one? I think we're there. Tēnā koe, Judge Joe. Tēnā koe, Catherine. Great pleasure. Thank you. Kia ora and, and, and thank you. I think we've been treated tonight um, with some really fascinating insights and stories which have very much helped animate our um, experience and understanding of the Waitangi Tribunal and its work over the past uh, 40 years. Uh, just a few quick acknowledgements before we close. Um, first, thanks to the team of folks that have helped behind the scenes with tonight's event. I'd like to give a special mention uh, to my colleague Carwin Jones on the faculty in the New Zealand Centre for Public Law who assisted with the background preparation but who was abroad and unfortunately could not be with us tonight. But most importantly, uh, thanks to our 
two guests tonight um, who have helped us commemorate, I think, in very, very fitting fashion, 40 years um, of the Treaty of Waitangi Act. So thank you, uh, Judge Joe. Thank you, Catherine. And we have a small token of appreciation to thank you for your contribution. And one final note, if I can. This event is part of the New Zealand Centre for Public Law's landmark series where we're commemorating a number of, or a series of legal anniversaries that are occurring over this, this period. Our, our next event will be on Thursday evening, 5 November. Easy to remember, it's Guy Fawkes. Uh, where the famous case of um, Entick and Carrington will be in the spotlight. So we hope to see you there. So thank you and good evening.